All right, if you've watched our YouTube videos, you've heard us talk about it before, and they are back for another ad that is PDS Debt. How many of you wish there was a better solution to paying off your debt? Well, PDS Debt has customized 0% interest options for anyone struggling with credit cards, personal loans, collections, or medical bills. With inflation on the rise and gas prices hitting all-time highs, so glad I have a truck, now is the time to get serious about a better plan to pay off your debt. PDS Debt is giving our qualified listeners a free debt savings analysis just for completing the 30-second online debt assessment at pdsdebt.com slash husband. You heard me right. You get a free assessment if you go on to pdsdebt.com slash husband. So you can at least see if you qualify or not and as well get the analysis. And the link will be down below in the description. If you're making payments every month on your debt and your balances aren't going down, this program is for you. So PDS Debt actually rolls all your payments into one low 0% interest monthly payment. I and mean, then if you have over $10,000 or more in debt, you can qualify and there's no minimum credit score required. You can save thousands on interest and fees and you can pay off your debt in a fraction of the time. So PDS Debt is offering free debt analysis to our listeners just for completing the quick and easy debt assessment at www.pdsdebt.com slash husband. That's P-D-S-D-E-B-T.com slash husband. And just if you're curious about it, you want to check it out, you want to see what they can do for you, um, the link will be down below. Just click on it. You can go and take the assessment. Take back your financial freedom today by visiting pdsdebt.com slash husband. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to our podcast. This is Murder With My Husband. I'm Peyton Moreland. And I'm Garrett Moreland. And he's the husband. I'm the husband. All right. We have another bonus Patreon episode coming out this week, which I'm really excited for. And then also, did you want to talk about the new Discord we made for Patreon and Apple subscriptions? So we did launch a Discord. We are still in the learning process as well with everybody else. But if you're a Patreon, there's a way to automatically link your Patreon to the Discord. Uh, we actually posted instructions on Patreon, so go ahead and follow those if you have any questions. If you're on Apple subscriptions, um, in the notes below and then also on our social media, we're going to put how you can access that Discord if you're a subscriber there because it'll be a little bit different. We kind of have to manually do some things, but we, of course, are going to make that an option as well, and we're excited to see kind of how it goes. We're just... I know, trying to build the community a little bit and it should be fun. I'm really excited. I was kind of messing around on it earlier and we made all different ones. There's like a pet one and people were in there posting their pets and everyone was kind of talking about each other's pets. And there's a Garrett's 10 seconds one where people can get on and discuss that. Also case suggestions, things they want to see on the podcast. So I'm really excited to see how this whole thing plays out. But yeah, we got a discord. All right. I think that pushes us right over into your 10 seconds. Peyton and I will be playing in, well, not Peyton and I, Garrett, me, will be playing in a pickleball tournament uh, next weekend over Labor Day. Should be fun. I don't know how it's going to go, but either way, I'm going to have a great time. And Unless your partner sucks and then no, you're going to be mad. My partners will be good. Um, it'll be fun. I'm really excited. I get to go and cheer and bring my little lawn chair. My goal every time I do one of these tournaments is just to not lose every single game. <laughs> like that is, that's my goal. I keep the bar pretty low. So if <laughs> I at least I win one game, I can go home happy. As well, I got some new Nikes. Um, they're like court shoes. Which like, you needed because your last ones were, they were really dirty. They were a color that they don't sell anymore. Uh, so it took a while to find them. But I finally found them. I wanted them. I got them. Also, last thing, I've always been a big Ruka fan. So... I don't know. I just got a bunch of Ruka clothes. If anyone out there happens to work for Ruka, you know, <laughs> I'm here. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. And he wants to be sponsored pickleball player from Ruka. Oh, I'm not good enough. But if you promise that you'll sponsor me, I will work every day at it. <laughs> I will be really hard worker at it. And that's about all I got for 10 seconds this week. So let's hop right into it. All right. Our case sources are distractify.com, sportskita.com, dateline, and cbsnews.com. All right. So a lot of times on this podcast, we discuss a case that is very open and shut. It's either solved or unsolved. Either the killer is sitting in prison or police have no idea where to start with the case. But there are cases out there that seem to fall in neither category. Cases that police would deem solved 
but no one sits in prison for the crime because the killer is still out in the world free. These cases come about because there seems to not be enough evidence for police to actually charge the suspect, but they won't look at anybody else for the crime. Usually, this comes along with your fair share of opinions. Are the police right? Do they have the right guy? Or is there not enough evidence because they have the wrong person? Today, we will be covering one of these cases. Our episode this week begins on Mother's Day 2020, when the sheriff's office in Salida, Colorado, receives a 911 call. 49-year-old wife and mother, Suzanne Morphew, had gone for a mountain bike ride that day and never came back. Everyone in her life has grown worried, which was why the sheriff's station was getting the call. It was strange, no one could reach her, and they feared she needed help. People disappear in the forest all of the time. They prayed Suzanne wasn't one of them. Her husband, Barry, had been at work. Her two daughters were together on a camping trip in Idaho. So what had happened to Suzanne? Did she simply vanish in the woods, or had she met foul play? Is there a reason she was the only one home? On Mother's Day? I know. It kind of does. It doesn't matter to the story, no. Yeah. But also, it's like, I mean, it's fine. Like, I know life gets busy and crazy. I'm just curious. Was... I'm sure he was on a work trip, I assume. Yeah, he was working. And then the daughters Daughters are are older in college? Oh, camping. One is in college, but camping in Idaho over Mother's Day. So yeah, she was alone on Mother's Day. So Suzanne Morphew grew up in the small town of Alexandria, Indiana. It was while in high school that she met Barry Morphew at the local golf club. A boy, three years older than her, who had already graduated. Barry, too, had grown up in Alexandria and had been a star baseball player at their local high school. Barry was really good at baseball, good enough that he was actually drafted to play for the Toronto Blue Jays. But almost as soon as he started, Barry received a career-ending injury that sent him back home to Alexandria, where he eventually met Suzanne. Suzanne was still in high school, like I said, and she had it all going for her. She was popular, homecoming queen nominee, and the boys were taken by her. But that didn't matter because she was completely smitten by Barry. Because of this, Barry and Suzanne decided to go to college together and continue their relationship. Suzanne graduated high school and together they attended Purdue University. But when Suzanne was just 20 and Barry 23, the couple went through their first battle together when Suzanne was diagnosed with an aggressive form of lymphoma cancer. Barry stepped up and took care of her, stood by her side through all of it, held her hand through chemotherapy and all of the hardships at a time when Suzanne's family claimed it would have been easy for him to leave, like Mm -hmm. very easy. He was in college. They weren't married. He could have continued on with his own life and went with a different path. Instead, though, he stayed by Suzanne's side and literally carried her through cancer when she grew too weak to walk. But everything worked out because Suzanne eventually beat the cancer. And through that, Barry and her's relationship grew so strong that by 1994, they got married. And as newlyweds, Suzanne taught middle school and Barry decided to start a landscaping business to make ends meet. But Suzanne really wanted to be a mother and to start a family. And it was going to be hard after going through aggressive chemotherapy. Together, they prayed a lot. They were a very religious couple from the beginning, and they really believed it was a miracle when Suzanne eventually got pregnant. I always thought that it would be hard to be a professional athlete and then get injured, especially if you haven't made a lot of money up into that point right it's like all right well because he got drafted right out of high school yeah so he really i mean like i gotta figure out what to do now and yeah he's like oh i'm I'm dead set on this path i at least have what five years to to do this and see where it goes but then in the first year it just got Mm -hmm. canceled he had to move back home and start all over So Suzanne gets pregnant and not just once, but twice, which really was a miracle. Macy and Mallory, her two daughters, and they completed the Morphew family. Mm -hmm. And from there, the Morphews raised their daughters and made it through the stages of life in Indiana. Suzanne quit teaching and became a full-time stay-at-home mother after Barry worked hard, learned the trade, and created quite a successful landscaping business, eventually paying their house off completely. 
But finally, it came time for Mallory, their oldest of the daughters, to leave home for college while Macy was still at home in high school. When Mallory made the decision to head all the way to Colorado for college, Suzanne and Barry told friends and family that they were going to follow her, moving Macy as well. Suzanne wanted to remain close to Mallory, keep the family together, and Barry, well, he loved the outdoors. He was an avid hunter, a skilled trapper, and he had always wanted to eventually make it out to the West where hunting is what everyone does. So Suzanne felt like this was their chance. Mallory was going off to college and they could follow her. So the Morphew family packed up and made the move as a family. Suzanne, Barry, and Macy landing in the town of Salida, Colorado. Now Salida is a mountain town and very outdoorsy. The Arkansas River runs through Salida and it's known for its large amount of trails for mountain bikers. The Morphew's Salida home is beautiful, packed in the middle of pine trees sitting on this mountain. It's big, 3,200 square feet on seven acres of land. And it's Mm -hmm. very like cabin-y, woodsy feel. And this was the Morphew's new adventure, keeping their family close together as they continued their life. But as we know, things were about to turn sideways for their family. Does it mention anything about how, because I assume he didn't move his company because all his work was in his his town, his city. Right. So he did. He Mm. just started a new landscaping job Ah, um, in Colorado and it was doing fine. Like it was doing well. He had years and years of practice, obviously, Mm -hmm. with another successful company. So it was, yeah, he just started over there. So that Mother's Day, the girls were camping in Idaho and decided to shoot their mother a happy Mother's Day text. They felt bad that they were away from their mother for the day. But as the morning turned into afternoon, Suzanne never responded to the girls' text. So they texted again. No reply. They called. No answer. Thinking this was odd, they decided to call the neighbors and have them head over to the Morphew home and just check on Suzanne, their mother. What year are we at? 2020. Okay. But when the neighbor made their way over to the home, they knocked and rang, but no one answered. So this is when the neighbor decided to try and get a hold of Barry, Suzanne's husband. He eventually answered and the neighbor relayed what was going on. The girls had sent them over there to check on Suzanne, but no one was home. The neighbor asked, did Barry know where Suzanne was? Barry responded, no, he too hadn't heard from her and he was in Denver on a job. He asked the neighbor to check the garage and see if her mountain bike was there. He claimed she had plans to go riding that day, but she should have been home by now. The neighbor checked and Suzanne's mountain bike was gone. So she was most likely still out there. But that doesn't necessarily mean she's safe. Suzanne should have definitely made it home by now. So had something happened? Was she hurt, injured, in danger? The Morphew's neighbor decided to call the sheriff's department for the family and ask them to go out and help search for Suzanne while Barry was rushing back home from Denver to see what was going on. Salida dispatched officers and they began looking. This kind of call was not necessarily unusual in this area. People get lost all the time Mm -hmm. on trails. I mean, Growing up in Idaho, this happened all the time where it was like, oh, we haven't heard from him. He went out hunting. Yeah. We need to rescue him because he most likely is in trouble. Did she go hiking and biking by herself often? Yes, this was normal, but it was a newer hobby. It's not like she was super experienced because they had just moved and she had just kind of started picking this up. So it's not like she was advanced by any means. And once police started searching, it didn't take long for them to find something but it wasn't Suzanne. It was her mountain bike laying halfway down an embankment crashed on its side. And when I mean embankment, it was like a road and Uh then basically a cliff with like a grassy embankment down into the woods. And the bike was found halfway down that embankment. It wasn't very far from the Morphew home and the front tire of the bike was a little messed up. So when police gather the bike and make their way back to the Morphew home, they came upon a young man standing outside the family home in the driveway. Keep in mind, Hmm. no one from the Morphew family is here because the girls are in Idaho. Barry is rushing home from Denver. And so they pull up to the driveway and there's a young man standing there. It was Macy's boyfriend. Macy had been so worried back in Idaho that she had enlisted in his help in checking on her mom as well. So he had been out looking for Suzanne on his own. And he told police the little he knew. 
Macy and Mallory were camping in Idaho and Barry, their father, was in Denver working. They hadn't heard from their mom, i.e. I got sent here. I'm confused because I'm going to be very surprised if it's, I mean, I don't know if it's happened yet, but if, if it's someone random. The husband's gone and mm -hmm. there's proof of that. The girls are gone and there's proof of that. So I don't know where the story is going. Right. How does a mom just up and disappear? Yeah. So... Like I said, Barry was on his way home at this point, rushing home, worried about his wife. He called her family on the way, explaining that Suzanne had gone for a bike ride on the trails and hadn't come home. The girls and him had been trying to reach her all day, but she wasn't answering. Barry frantically and emotionally told Suzanne's family that police had found her bike crashed not far from home, but still there was no sign of her. By the time Barry makes it almost a three hour drive from Denver to the house, it's dark outside. He pulls in and he meets police. Friends and family also have shown up by this point and all of this can be seen from police body cam footage. So there's footage of this whole thing going down. Okay. And on the footage, Barry is frantic. He hugs Suzanne's friends and then makes his way back to investigators. He's like, where's her bike? Where was it found? Yeah. How much damage was on the bike? Is it possible she crashed? Maybe it had been a mountain lion, he says. There had been some sightings lately. Maybe she had been attacked, stalked by an animal of some sort. Police tell him they have no idea and they ask him when was the last time he had seen Suzanne he tells them that morning before he left for Denver yeah he woke up she was still in bed asleep and he left around 5 a.m police asked to go inside the beautiful mountain house to look for clues and Barry willingly lets them in they gather Suzanne's clothes to give to search dogs for a scent. And as I was researching this, I sometimes think about in these stories how loved ones must feel when, you know, the, the disappearance has become so real that they are now handing over clothing items for dogs to sniff mm -hmm. and hopefully find. I mean, that moment has to be so just jarring. Police discover Suzanne's ID and wallet in her car in the garage, but struggle to locate her cell phone. They also find her sunglasses and hydration water pack that she would have used on a bike ride. So this seems weird. And even Barry's like, this is weird. Why was it left behind if she went on a bike ride, which her bike was found? Why did she leave her sunglasses and her water hydration pack that yeah. she always uses on her rides? And that was basically all police discovered when searching the home. It really seemed as if she had gone for a bike ride and vanished. In the days that followed, friends, family, and the town of Salida rallied together to search for Suzanne Morphew. Searches were happening every day with the police, but the only other thing found was Susan's helmet in a completely different location off the side of a road. Yeah, that's weird. I don't know why they can't. Like, where is she? Right. I mean, even if she was attacked by an animal or crashed, there would yeah. be some and trail. And if they've been searching already, where is she? Right. And also weird that her helmet is found in a complete opposite direction mm -hmm. of where her bike was. So although the common thought was she'd most likely been attacked by an animal of some sort, no presumably way. stalked and hunted. Which, I mean, it does happen. It does happen. Yeah. So I'm not saying no way as in no way, but... You don't think it's happened here? Not here. And her family feels the same way. Her family's like, that just doesn't seem right. They sat Barry down and told him he needed to confront the real possibility that Suzanne had been attacked by a human, maybe even kidnapped, human trafficked, like ran into some sort of problem when she was going yeah. for a bike Barry's ride. Barry's like, thank you, I know. So right. how do we find her? So Barry decided to put out a video on Facebook asking for help. He sits down. It's a professional video. You can still mm -hmm. watch it. And he tells Suzanne if she's out there and seeing this, that the family loves and misses her. He doesn't care how, like, if there's a certain number that needs to be put out in order for him to get her back, he'll pay anything. Barry even offered a $200,000 reward for anyone that wow. would come forward and lead to her discovery. But time goes on. And Suzanne remains missing, her disappearance a mystery. So police decide that although most signs point to something happening to her while she's on a bike ride, they, they decide they better do their due diligence and look into any reason that someone would want Suzanne to disappear. Maybe this wasn't random. Maybe someone in her life had come for her and wanted her to disappear. 
They start back in Indiana, where Suzanne and Barry grew up and eventually fell in love. They learn about Barry, the star athlete who lost his chance at baseball and moved home to find Suzanne. And who'd want to hurt Suzanne? She's a cancer survivor. Right. A mom. mom. Right. Um, the police learn how they went to college together and Barry held her hand through cancer their fight to have children and exactly how they ended up in Salida. Mm -hmm. But police learned that right before the family's big move, they had received some heartbreaking news. Suzanne's cancer had returned and they had been faced with a decision. Do they stay back and handle this or do they move forward with their plans to move to Colorado following their daughter? As we know, they chose to do that. But Suzanne decided that she could battle it from anywhere and felt like the move was important for the family. But if fighting cancer with doctors you already know and trust isn't a big enough deterrent for putting off your move, what was so important about moving to Colorado? That's what police are wondering. Which is true because, I mean, I feel like kids will go off to college all the time and families don't move. Right. So like it's, and that's why I asked about the job earlier, because especially if you're in some sort of blue collar successful um, like i feel like it's i feel like it'd be hard to pick up your landscaping business go to a completely different city and start over again completely um so that's interesting and not just you are wondering this police are like okay well if she just you know had a team of doctors yeah. in colorado that had already helped her get rid of her cancer once why still pick up and move yeah what's going so on they ask and people and individuals close to suzanne and barry say well the move to Salida wasn't just because they were chasing Mallory off to college. The Morphew's marriage had been struggling, mm. a, a midlife crisis, if you will. It had been 26 years. That's a long time to be married. People change. They had weathered life, raised children, and now one was going off to college. So close friends and family figured that the move to Salida was also about a change of scenery, a fresh start, not just for the family, but for their marriage as well. Maybe moving and starting over was exactly what they needed to get back on track as a couple. So Suzanne and Barry forged ahead despite the cancer, despite the fact that he was going to leave his business. They left their doctors, moved to Colorado, and within months of getting there, her cancer was actually successfully treated. Wow, okay. So she got rid of her cancer there as well. While police are learning all of this, time was passing in the case. Spring and summer rushed by as the search went on. From sun up to sundown, volunteers continued looking. Friends and family noticed the impact it had on the Morphews. The girls were constantly devastated, crying and hurting for their mother. Barry was quiet, heartbroken. It appeared everything had taken a toll on him and it was changing huh. him. He was no longer the carefree, happy man he had once been. He slept on the living room couch, refusing to sleep in the bed without Suzanne. I mean, everyone in their life was like, geez, this was this what is pretty the heartbreaking. Heck? Where is she? Right. But since so much time had passed and not even a sliver or a clue had surfaced as to where Suzanne was, the theory that it was an animal attack was seeming less and less likely. If an animal had attacked Suzanne, remains would have turned up by now. They had done so many searches. With that being said, suspicion started to be cast on Barry. I mean, yeah. Everyone always thinks it's the husband. Like there's no way this time. And in today's day and age, with true crime being more popular than ever, and this was only 2020, social media did its thing and began raising suspicion on Barry as well. Okay. Posts began popping up. What really are the chances that a wife just ups and disappears? Has the husband been looked into? Is anyone looking at the husband? And it wasn't just the media who who you know, had speculations about Barry. Four months after she disappeared, Barry had done almost 30 hours of voluntary interviews with police because police are looking into the husband. And police were confronted with concerns from Suzanne's family as well as time went on without answers. It was the little things. He didn't show up to her vigil. He skipped out on some of the searches, which I will go on record right here and say, I don't think that means that the husband did it. I'm obviously not a family member, nor do I have any connection to this case. But from the outside looking in, it's hard to evaluate people's behavior mm. in grief. And I think it's something we do too often. Would you come to my searches? Well, I think, of course, if your loved one went missing, you would do everything you could to find them. Mm -hmm. But also, you're just trying to survive. He has 
two daughters, I mean, and his friends and family have said that he seemed to really be hurting. Like yeah. genuinely, they saw a shift in his personality. They saw a, a shift in everything. And it's something to think about. Like, you know, we're yeah. always so quick to, quick to say it was the husband um, and, oh, well, look at how he acted at the vigil. But maybe just sometimes mm. that's not the case. Yeah, I don't know. But Suzanne's family told police, you know, at first they weren't saying anything about Barry. But after some time had passed and they had felt like maybe his behavior was a little odd, they came forward to police and said they needed to tell them something. That after Suzanne's first battle with cancer way back in college, a power dynamic had been laid out in the relationship. Suzanne needed Barry. Suzanne relied on Barry and not the other way around. He made all of the decisions. He made all of the money. He decided almost everything in the marriage. He even was charged by police for illegally casting her voting ballot after she disappeared. So she disappeared. That's and weird. he still cast a, a vote for her That's weird. in her name for the election. Suzanne's sister, Melinda, actually came forward at this point and claimed that she had talked to Suzanne about the struggles in Suzanne and Barry's relationship. And Suzanne had confirmed it, which again, this is not clear out there. I think sisters talk all the time about things that are going on in their marriage and, oh, well, he always does this and it drives me nuts. Suzanne said to Melinda that she felt like a trophy in Barry's life, but not much else. Suzanne felt like she didn't have much power or choice in the marriage. At least this is what Melinda says she was told. Suzanne even alluded to Melinda that there was maybe some infidelity issues on Barry's end, which was part of the reason the move mm. to Colorado was such a fresh start for them. But not everyone felt this way about Barry and Suzanne's relationship. Friends even came forward in the couple's defense, claiming that people were just searching for answers in places there weren't any, that they really did have a good relationship. Everyone wanted a marriage marriage okay. like theirs and that Barry and Suzanne were happy and healthy. And although many had come forward to try and help, police were tight lipped about their investigation. They weren't saying anything about who their suspect was, who they were looking into, had they found anything. And eventually a year passed in the case and it seemingly grew cold as everyone in Suzanne's life tried to heal the wound of her missing. But then on May 5th, 2021, a press conference was held by police about what they had been working on in the last year. The case had not in fact grown cold. Police had just been working in secret and they were about to announce something that would shock everyone. All right, well, I had such high hopes for Barry, but they are slowly starting to dwindle away. But do you think this is solid enough evidence? I, we're going to find that in a second because police obviously said, have something. Correct. So what do the police have to say? So the sheriff's announce that morning, a little over a year after Suzanne went missing, that police had arrested Barry Morphew for the wow. murder of his wife, okay. Suzanne Morphew. Barry's family and friends were stunned at the news. That's nuts. While Suzanne's family felt police were on the right track. But theories and feelings don't lead to an arrest. So what evidence did police have that the public didn't know about? Also, like the daughters, man, that, oh, that sucks. sucks. That's horrible position for them. Right. And was the evidence police had strong? So police come forward and tell the public some of the evidence they have against Barry. The first point was evidence of a collapsing marriage between Barry and Suzanne, which leads to motive. Mm -hmm. Remember back on the day Suzanne went missing and police found Macy's boyfriend searching for her? Well, during the body cam footage, when they talked to him, the boyfriend said Suzanne and Barry were having some issues and had talked about separating, maybe getting a divorce. So this gives motive. This initially tells police, okay, the how, marriage is on the rocks. How would he know? Just because the daughter told him? Yeah, because the daughter okay, told okay. him. But don't just take the boyfriend's word for it. Although police never found Suzanne's phone, they discovered text messages from Suzanne's phone to her best friend just days before she disappeared. And one of the text messages said this, I wouldn't feel safe alone with Barry. That's what she texted her friend days before she disappeared. Okay. Another four days before the disappearance from Suzanne to Barry himself. So there was another text found on in her text messages from Suzanne to Barry. And it said, I am done. 
I don't care what you are up to and have been for years. We just need to figure this out civilly. And then two days before she disappeared, Suzanne texted her sister Melinda these texts while talking about her and Barry's problems. Quote, he's also been abusive emotionally and physically. I feel Mm. more angry now. Anger at what I've allowed. And then two days later, Suzanne went missing. I think that I would say, yes, it's enough evidence, but I don't think that's okay, if that makes sense. So what I'm trying to say is, I guess, is it really enough evidence? No. Do I think he's guilty? Well, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, here's the thing. I just feel like, I just don't think it's that rare. I think if you were to search... 100 women's text messages, okay, good point. 95 of them would text someone complaining about their husband. Mm. Now, would 95 of them say he was physically yeah, and emotionally I think, abusive? I think there's a difference between no. someone complaining and saying, oh, oh, he's annoying me. He didn't put away his laundry. Yeah, something like that. Or, oh, he's physically and emotionally abusing abusive. me. That's, and I, that's, that's, that, that's a big step further, in my opinion. I will agree. I will agree. So the second point of evidence that police claim they have was physical from the day before she disappeared. Evidence of Barry's cell phone pinging through the Morphew home in a hurried and peculiar movement, almost like he was running through the house. And if you're on YouTube, you'll see the picture. If not, I'm just going to describe it for you. Say you're looking at the top of a home. His cell phone was just running from this corner to this corner to this corner, back to this corner, back outside, now back to the back door, into the garage, back into the bedroom. So it was like all zigzaggy and Mm -hmm. jagged. And this is the day before she went missing. So police determine that this cell phone evidence means Barry was running through the house, which they concur means he was chasing Suzanne through the house because why else would someone run through their home? How can they determine that? Well, how did they get that evidence? I don't know from his cell phone, I'm assuming, because it's, it's like down to the millisecond of when he was at that point. I did not even know that was possible to do. To I do. didn't either, but I saw the I saw the picture of the evidence okay. in the sources. So, police are like, well, this means there was a chase. That's what they that's assume. what they assume. And after that chase, from 2:47 p.m. until 10:17 p.m., again, this is the day before Mother's Day. So, the day before she's missing, Barry's home with her alone. And their daughters are already in Idaho camping and he's going to get up the next morning and leave Mm -hmm. to go to work. So after this little chase section from 2 to 10 p.m., Barry's cell phone is put on airplane mode, which means they're unable to track anything else at that point. Why why would you ever put your cell phone on air? Even I mean, I feel like even sometimes when I'm on a plane, I don't even put it on airplane mode. Garrett. I'm just saying that I forget sometimes. So if the plane goes down, it's Garrett. It's my fault. Yes. Yes. Um, But, I mean, police ask the same exact question you just did. I mean, this doesn't mean he killed her. Mm -hmm. But also, why would you put your phone on airplane mode from 2 to 10? There was also damage to the primary bedroom door frame. Like someone had barricaded themselves inside and the door was kicked open. Oh, wow. So the primary bedroom door had been kicked in, according to evidence. Another piece of evidence police put forward was evidence physically found inside the house and the day after events. There was an unspent bullet casing in the primary bedroom. There was a tranquilizer dart gun found in the home along with a tranquilizer dart cap found in the dryer with Suzanne's DNA on it. Oh my gosh. Now keep in mind, Barry is an avid hunter. He has guns all over this place. So yeah, again, it's, okay, okay. it's not, I mean, it's not like that abnormal that there's a tranquilizer, yeah. but also yeah. police are like, hey, why do you have a tranquilizer if you're a hunter? Like you don't need to make animals fall asleep. And then he said, well, because I'm shooting them with the tranquilizer dart gun, they fall asleep. And then I'm illegally cutting off their horns and selling them on the black market. So that's why he claims he had a tranquilizer gun. Police Mm. believe this means a tranquilizer gun was used inside the house. If it was in the house and there was a cap in the dryer with just Suzanne's DNA on it, they think that means it was shot in the house. And to follow that theory up, police provided electronic evidence from Barry's truck that showed around 9.30 p.m. the night before Mother's Day. So after they assume this whole chase happened and he turns his phone on airplane mode, 
his truck left the house, even though he told police he went to bed around 10. So at 930, his truck leaves. But he told police he went to bed at 10 that night. I don't understand why people lie. I, it's just crazy to me that he thinks, oh, it's 2020. There's not enough technology for them to find out where I am. Well, in his defense, he could have left and came back before 10 p.m. He left at 930. He says he went to bed at 10. OK, yeah. I so see that. I'm just playing devil's advocate yeah, yeah, yeah. here, OK, which I have to do. On top of that, evidence showed the next morning the doors on his truck opening and closing several times during the hours of 3 and 4 a.m. Mother's Day morning. Okay. Now, this is not that weird, but Barry initially told police he set his alarm and woke up at 4.30 a.m. that day and then left at 5 to go to Denver. So why was his truck doors opening and closing multiple times between 3 and 4 if his alarm wasn't set until 4.30, why was he awakened in his truck? So, yes, he did just get caught in a lie, no, flat out. No attorney yet on Barry's side? Well, now that he's arrested, yes, an attorney. But okay. before this, no. Once Barry actually left that morning for his job site 150 miles away, he told cops he turned left instead of right coming out of his neighborhood which he would normally go right to leave town. And he says he turned left because he saw some elk and he wanted to go get a closer look. The only holdup with this is the road going left is where Suzanne's helmet was found, mm. almost like it had been thrown out of a car. So he says he turned left to see Come some elk. On, Her yeah. helmet's found that way. And he would usually go right to go to work. Even more suspicious, Barry's cell phone showed that he stopped five separate times in different locations along the way to Denver. So while driving to Denver, he stopped five different times. And at all locations he stopped, there were dumpsters where Barry can be seen on surveillance footage dumping bags of trash into each oh different my dumpster. Gosh. But the last piece of evidence that police produced was a spy pen that they believe Suzanne bought to try and catch Barry cheating on her. So this pen was basically a normal looking pen. You could click it and it would record audio. And Suzanne bought it to try and catch Barry cheating. Now, when police downloaded the audio off of the spy pen, they did find incriminating audio, but it wasn't against Barry cheating on Suzanne. It was of Suzanne cheating on Barry. Which again, Interesting. they claimed was motive. Even though it was her cheating on him, they claimed this is motive. Uh, got it. Suzanne had reconnected on Facebook with an old friend from high school, a married father of six. Suzanne's affair had lasted two years. Okay. They had met in multiple different states and places. The day before she went missing, Suzanne and her lover exchanged 50 text messages, which stopped right before Barry got home. He never heard from her again which makes one think that she actually went missing that day and not the next day, Mother's Day, because why wouldn't she have texted him the following day? And this was the evidence the state put forward claiming. Now, although none of this says he directly killed her, if you connect the dots between all of it, it shows that Barry killed Suzanne. Now, they think he found out about the affair the day before she went missing when he came home. She was actually like... She wasn't FaceTiming. She was on WhatsApp video calling uh -huh. her boyfriend. And Barry was texting her and saying, I'm on the way home. Hey, are you like, what are you doing? I'm on the way home. And then boom, she never, the lover never hears from her again. Okay. So police's theory was he came home and found out that she had been video chatting. And then he finds out that she is having an affair on him. Police say this was his last straw because he was already on edge from the impending marriage failure, the divorce that she was texting him saying she wanted, and he couldn't handle the fact that she was going to leave him. So Barry chased her through the house, eventually tranquilized her, and then loaded her body up the next morning and dumped evidence and her in five separate dumpsters on the way to oh his job gosh. site. I'm, yeah, I'm wondering how he did that. Right. But Barry claims, he's like, I had no idea about the fair until you just told me. He's like, I didn't even know she was having an affair until you police just put this on like as evidence, which if true, he did never tell anyone. He never talked about it to anyone. If he found out about it, no one ever knew that he knew. 
And he also said that his cell phone running around his property was actually him outside hunting down some pesky chipmunks that had been invading their home. But police looked okay. and there was no dead chipmunks found around the home. But he said that's what he, that's why he was zigzagging, well, zigzagging was because he was chasing, chasing chipmunks. Chasing the pesky chipmunks. Yes. Okay. Which, I mean, a lot of people made jokes about. This was probably the first time chipmunks were used as an alibi yeah, uh -huh. in a case. Now, Barry claims the damaged door frame in his bedroom, that wasn't from him. It could have been from any time with literally anybody, but he had nothing to do with that. And the truck doors opening and closing, well, I was loading my truck for work. I do it every single day. I must have just got the time the time's wrong. But like, that's completely normal for me to make multiple trips. I'm a landscaper. That's what I do. Barry explains the dumpster stops on his way to work uh, were just him disposing of trash in his car. He didn't like to pay. He's Garrett. He didn't like to pay <laughs> to go to a dump. And so he was just throwing trash in all of these different dumpsters where he could. Now, this one seems the most weird to me. Like that one seems like the most weird excuse because why not just go to one? Yeah, I don't know. I could, I buy it though. I mean, that that can happen. To five different ones though? I mean, it depends. If he had a bunch of trash and maybe the dumpsters were each pretty full, he just spread it out over the just five. Just spread it out. I just think it's quite weird to like stop five different times. Yes. And then also he says, well, if I disposed of her or, you know, killed her, there's no evidence in the house of mm -hmm. it. The police found no physical evidence that Suzanne died in that house. Okay, so trial. So there's no body. There is no blood evidence or DNA that even uh -huh. shows a murder. In fact, the only suspicious DNA they found in this case was unknown DNA in Suzanne's car that matched unknown DNA from several sexual attacks in Arizona. What? Right. That is insane. Right. So this definitely gives the defense some a pretty good defense. Like, hey, so there's oh a serial, gosh. there's a serial attacker in Arizona and you have his DNA on record in these attacks and now his DNA is in Suzanne's car, yet you're still going to say it's her husband. That's a pretty good That's defense. That's a really good defense. And, and the prosecution has no, no idea what to do with that. They're just like, well, yeah. What I mean, a coincidence. I guess, I yeah. Mean, what do you use that? I guess the DNA is in her car. We don't know how it got there, but it's there. Now, Barry and Suzanne's daughters stick by Barry's side the second he gets arrested. And they claim his innocence. They're like, our dad okay. had nothing to do with our mom's disappearance. Same with Barry and Suzanne's friends. Like, all of them come forward and say, no, there's absolutely no way he did this. Now, according to 9news.com, in April, just weeks before he was set to go to trial, a judge dismissed the murder April 2022. This is just barely happening right now. He dismissed the case. A judge dismissed the murder case against Barry Morphew after the defense filed a motion for it. So I'm just going to dumb it down. Basically, the state was taking Barry to trial and then the judge said they tried to dismiss it once. And the judge said, no, I think there's enough evidence. Then Barry's defense team came forward and said, that's OK, but we're going to um, we need to tell you that the prosecution has been slow on getting evidence back to us. The judge looked into it and said, yes, the prosecution, the state was slow on giving evidence back. And because of that, I'm going to throw out nine of their 12 witnesses in the case. What? So then the state was like, well, we don't have enough. Like we yeah. barely have enough as is. We were, we were, I mean, they didn't say that, but let's be honest. They have no physical evidence. And so it was already going to be risky. But now that nine of their witnesses got thrown out, they were like, okay. So then the, the defense filed a motion and said, can we please just throw out the case? There's not enough evidence here. And the judge granted it and said, yep, it's dismissed. So now what? So the state most likely does not have enough evidence to go to trial, but they still can have a chance to rearrest and charge Barry if they find more evidence. So it's not like he's exonerated. He's just out right now with the state saying they don't have enough evidence, but they believe it's him. And that's where we are. That's where we are in the case. What he's in the off world? and the state No way. The state has made a press conference and said we're this close to finding Suzanne's body, and once we find her body, he will be arrested again. But they believe 100% they have the right guy. They're not looking into anyone else. It's Barry. And Barry's out now. I don't understand how they said they think they're this close to finding the body if they think he dumped the bodies in the trash cans. Well, they I don't know if they necessarily believed he chopped her up and dumped her. Oh, I, I'm thinking maybe they think so he sad. just dumped her somewhere along the path. Oh, I see. There was... 
missing GPS coordinates from his truck. There was a chunk of time, like four hours that was missing, which when they talk to the truck company, they say, it's a computer. It overrides. Like it happens all the time. It's not that weird that you have this section of his day and this section of his day, but not this section of his day that just happens. So there's four hours missing where he could have drove anywhere. He could have gone and done anything anywhere. I mean, I don't think they necessarily think he was throwing her in the trash cans, but they think maybe he dumped her body along the way, staged the bike, threw out the helmet, everything. And so that's where we're at. I mean, that's where we are. You can't help but wonder what actually happened to Suzanne. Is there a possibility it was an animal attack? Is there a possibility someone else attacked her? Is it possible that Barry murdered her? Mm. How do you explain the DNA found in the car from other unsolved cases? Cross-contamination? She just happened to have that person in her car? Like, how do you explain that? But then also, why did Barry stop at five separate dumpsters? And what about the tranquilizer gun? I don't think speculating to go as far as spreading rumors is healthy in a case like this, but you can't help but ponder all of the evidence yourself and try your best to make sense of it. For me, there's definitely not enough put forward to determine if he did it or not. I am. I think the judge dismissing the case was the correct decision because I don't think there's enough evidence to take this to trial. But then I go back to the fact that it has most of the signs that point to spousal murder in a fair an ending marriage or impending divorce. He was the last person to see her. Like it's all so complicated. And that's what's so hard with cases like Suzanne's is police believe they have the right man, but there's not enough evidence to prove it. Holy crap. So I, first of all, so sad that she is dead and no one has any idea what happened. Right. Sad for the girls, sad for, I don't know whether to say sad or not for Barry, because I don't know. I think I feel indifferent about it. Right. But I think I was pretty sure it was him until the whole DNA thing. Yeah. That, what? And they've ran the DNA against her lover. So it's not like her boyfriend was in the car. It just doesn't make sense. Smashed. Like, how does that happen? Like, what? how does that even make sense? I don't know. And it's so true that if this case gets taken to trial, his lawyers are going to put forward how could he be sitting here on trial if there is DNA from another serial rapist and attacker in her car? How could you even say it was him? The only, they would not be able to, in my opinion, prove that he did it, if he did do it, unless they find the body. And found some t type of DNA that, that leads just, back to there's him. There's just not enough evidence. I agree. And, and it's hard because he's still out there. The daughters are still out there. So I also at the same time want to be like, hey, Barry, you killed your wife. Right. But at the same time, if he did do it and he's getting away with it, hey, Barry, you killed your wife. Right. So I don't I don't know how I feel. I don't know. That's a hard one. This is a tough one. These cases are always so complicated. And it really is just the issue of everyone sticking by his side, his daughter sticking by his side. How are you supposed to look at him and be like, no, you for sure did it. Exactly. It's so hard. But then... How do you deny the circumstantial evidence? I don't know. I don't even know what you do in this situation. I am glad that I am not. One, please don't send me any jury duty stuff because I do <laughs> not want that case. Right. And two, I just don't, it's just hard. And police, I mean, they, they are dead set that it's him, but they don't have the evidence to prove yeah, it. I, so I guess stay tuned because if there are ever any updates in this case, we will give you an update. But there is a fat chance that this case just grows cold again. I mean, if they don't find more evidence, they're not going to rearrest him. Yeah, it's hard because I think if I were on the jury, I, I'm sure I would say, yeah, he did it, even though it's not fair. I'm just, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. Gary, you will never get called to you, jury you duty. You never know. You, they, you might get called. You will, they will never pick you. They might. They, they might will want not. me. They might say, I want that guy right there. <laughs> I want I want him. You put him on right the now. The defense will never let it. They'll they'll listen to this podcast and go, every time he says he's guilty. Every single what time. If, oh, what if I trick the defense? That's lying. That's perjury. I would never do such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the case of Suzanne. And like I said, stay tuned. I guess we will That's give you sad, updates yeah. if we have them. We do have an update tab on our discourse. So you can also see our updates there. And we will see you guys next week with another episode. I love it. And I hate it. Goodbye. Goodbye.